you want a title for this morning's message, the title is going to be Covenant. I'm going to ask you to stand with me for the reading of the word. We're in Judges chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Now the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochum, and he said, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give to your fathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. What is this you have done? So now I say, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall become thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare to you. As soon as the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the people of Israel, the people lifted up their voices and wept. And they called the name of that place Bochim. And if you don't know what Bochim means, it means weeping. And they sacrificed there to the Lord. Let's take a moment to pray. Lord, very simply put, we'll pray that you speak to us through your word. This is a message of freedom and encouragement. So Lord, I pray that we would receive it as such. That you would reveal what needs to be revealed. Not just for head knowledge, but so we can be free. That individually, as a church family, that we can walk in your full power and freedom. And we receive it now. In Jesus' name, we command every lying spirit. We command everything that the enemy would try to do to hinder, distract, deter, or frustrate God's people. Broken, destroyed, thrown out, now and forevermore. In the name of Jesus, you have no place here. You're not welcome here. We say go and stay out. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. My first point this morning is that we are all in some form of covenant. Every single one of us. Even if you don't think you are. Even if you don't know what the word covenant means. You're in one. And I want to look at verses 1 and 2 in our main passage again. Listen to what's said here. I'm going to jump in in the middle of verse 1 where the angel of the Lord says, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. The word covenant, if you don't know what that means, it's, it's a binding agreement. It's a contract, if you will. A covenant means, in the same way, I am in covenant relationship with my wife. We signed legal documentation that says, I am her husband, she is my wife. We have that kind of relationship with God as Christians. And if you're not a Christian, you have that kind of relationship with something else. But I want to tell you this. Regardless of whether or not, there, there is no single person in the kingdom, so to speak. Yes, I know the Bible says that we're, we won't marry in heaven. I'm talking about covenant relationship in a spiritual realm. You have covenant relationship either with God or something else. And God is calling out to the children of Israel in Judges chapter 2. And there are a couple of things in the first couple of verses that stand out to me when it comes to understanding covenant relationship with God. The first one is very encouraging. God will never break His covenant with you. That's exactly what it says at the end of verse 1. He says, I, will, I told you guys, I will never break my covenant with you. I will never, ever, ever break my covenant with you. How many of you are thankful for that? Numbers 23, 19 says, God is not man that he should lie, or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not fulfill it? Simply put, Aaron translation, God does what he says. He keeps the promises that he gives, and he keeps the covenant relationship with us that we agree to with him. He's faithful. If you look a little later in the Old Testament, at the end of Joshua 23 and verse 14, this is right before Joshua dies, he tells the children of Israel, after they've gotten into the promised land, he says, you know in your hearts and souls, all of you, that not one word has failed of all the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you. All, say all. all. 
all have come to pass for you. Not one of them has failed. That is the God we serve. Not one single thing that He promises fails. Period, point blank, end of discussion. You should find comfort and peace in that. That the promises of God will come to pass. That His covenant relationship with you remains. That He never leaves, nor does He forsake those who love and fear Him. How many of you agree with that? But if that's true, that God always keeps His covenant promise, He never breaks His covenant with us, if that's true, then it's also true that any time there's a disconnect between us and God, we're the ones guilty of creating that. And we're guilty of it when we come into agreement with someone or something else. Where we give access into our lives to something or someone else that belongs to God alone. When we open ourselves up to things that God told us never to open ourselves up to. It brings me to a question. With whom or with what are you in agreement right now? If you look at our main passage, I want you to grab hold of this. God had told the children of Israel. He had told them all. He said, in verse 2, You shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land, and you shall do what? Break down their altars. Their places of worship that were ungodly. Their idols that they had set up. To false gods. God told the children of Israel, break those things down. So my question for everyone that's here today is, what altars have you left standing in your life that God has told you to tear down? You cannot live with God and sin in the same house. Those two things will not live together. They will not remain together. They cannot And the problem that I'm finding in all of the church today, not just victory, but all over the place, friends, I'm telling you, there's a problem because we want to try to intermarry the things of God with the things of the world, and we wonder why documentaries and different things come out that explain that there's sin in the church. Friends, if you look all the way back in Joshua's story, I want you to remember there's a passage in the book of Joshua about a man named Achan. Right after they defeated the people of Jericho, they saw God perform a mighty miracle. All they did was walk around the wall a whole bunch of times, and when how many times they were told to walk was up, they met God's quota, they stopped, they yelled, the walls fell down, they had victory, glory to God. If that don't sound Pentecostal, I don't know what does. Shout, and God will give you the victory. Woo, glory. Glory. I should have had my towel ready to wave it there. But then what happens? Compromise enters into the victor's camp. The people who won. A man named Achan decides that all the stuff that was supposed to uh, be taken care of, destroyed, he says, I'm going to take some of that for me. And so he does, and, and we find out that that, that, that later on the, the children of Israel face a much weaker enemy than the people of Jericho, but this time they're defeated. I want to tell you something today, and, and I, want this to, I want this to resonate, because so many times we pretend that we can hide our sin, but in reality your sin affects everybody around you. Your areas of compromise in your life affect everybody around you. The areas in which you let your guard down, it's not just about, oh, nobody knows. Well, number one, God does. Number two, not only does God know, but there's certain things you're opening yourself up to, but not just yourself. You're opening up your whole family. If you look in that same story with Achan, what happened? He wasn't the only one that was punished. It was him and his whole family were dealt with. What are the things that we're in agreement with right now, friends? What are the altars that you've left standing that God has told you to tear down? You can't have the world and Jesus. Friends, Jesus himself says, what good is it for a man to gain the entire world and yet forfeit his soul? James 4, 4 says it this way, you adulterous people. That's not nice language. How many of you know that? There's even an exclamation point after that. 
So let, let me do it in James's writing. Let me be James's voice for a moment through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. You adulterous people! Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity? The word enmity means hostility. Friendship with the word means you are hostile with God. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself what? An enemy of God. How many of you think that's kind of scary? So all these agreements, all these covenants, all these things that we do spiritually with with sin and even with people who would cause us to move towards sin. All of these agreements that we come into, friends, they affect us in some way. And you either align yourself to walk in friendship with God or to become an enemy of God. How many of you know that's a bad place to be, to be an enemy of God? How many of you don't want to be an enemy of God? Then the question is, what are the altars in your life that need torn down today? What are the things in your life that you've allowed to stick around that God said, "Mm -mm, it's got to go? What agreements have you settled into with the enemy? And why? Why have you settled into those agreements with the enemy? I believe this right now because I can feel it. There are people that are here today who have, in some way, whether they knew they did or they didn't, you've made covenants with the enemy for a false sense of peace and pleasure. You either don't want to deal with the spiritual battle or you want to leave room to gratify your flesh. So you compromise in the exact same way that the children of Israel did. Friends, how many of you know it's a lot better to learn from somebody else's mistakes than to make them yourself? I try to tell my kids that all the time. Learn from when dad was dumb. I said that past tense. I hope you caught that. (laughs) Learn from dad's mistakes. Learn from mom's mistakes so you don't have to make them. We have so much in Scripture that we can learn on this particular topic of what happens with God's people when we come into covenant agreement with God with things that God has told us to tear down and destroy. The roller coaster happens only when God's people say, I want God today and I want the world tomorrow. Maybe if your life looks like this. See, because my Bible tells me that we go from glory to glory. Right? So, so yeah, you, you, we go through stuff. I understand that. Nobody's life is perfect. And all God's people said, you know, we all deal with things. There are trials and tribulations. The book of James earlier on tells us that we should consider those situations joy because they help us to grow. They help us to, to become more like Jesus when we go through it. Scripture talks all about being refined in the fire. Yes, we go through situations that we didn't bring upon ourselves. Sometimes we did bring those things upon ourselves through our disobedience. I want to tell you this. I want to say this again because I want this to grab, because this is the whole meat of this message and what it's all built off of. There are people that are here today. You've made covenant with the enemy because you think you're in a position of peace and pleasure. When in reality, what you've done is allowed the enemy to camp out in your backyard. You've given the enemy easy access into your life, into your family, because you think you're in peace. But then really, all you are is one misstep away from a battle all over again that you didn't even have to fight if you would have just destroyed the enemy that you're supposed to destroy in the first place. Friends, it's, 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 this is all, this is not just victory. This is all over the church. We want one foot in the church and one foot in the world, and it cannot be that way. It doesn't work. You choose this day who you'll serve. For those of you that would say, I'm scared of spiritual warfare, let me give you a couple tips. Number one, don't pray dumb. What do I mean by that? Don't say, oh, I'm going to take on every attack of the day. Don't pray dumb. I mean, you know that, that life has enough of its stuff all on its own. We don't have to tell the enemy, hey, bring it on. That's, I prayed that one time when I was like 19. It's the dumbest prayer I've ever prayed in my life. I'm serious. I I can remember when it happened. I was going through something. I'm mad. I'm in my car. I'm on my way to college classes at the time. And I'm like, you know how it is? You have those Jesus moments where you're just crying. Oh, I love you, Lord. And then in the middle, I just get mad. And in my flesh, in my zeal, trying to sound all spiritual, I prayed something really stupid. Bring it on. And And the enemy does. And there were things that came from that 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 were not fun. So I want to say this again. Don't pray dumb. 
But I will say this, don't live afraid. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in me. I don't have to be afraid. Will there be resistance? Will there be issues? Will there be things that, that have to be dealt with? Absolutely. But when you know who you are as a child of God, the power and the authority that God has given to you in His kingdom, as an ambassador of His kingdom, changes the way you see everything. You understand that if God be for me, who can be against me? When the enemy comes in like a flood, God raises up a standard against them. On and on I could go. Know who you are as a child of God. And when you know who you are as a child of God, you don't fear spiritual warfare. Again, you don't stick your head in front of a gun, so to speak. But you don't have to be afraid of anything that the enemy would try to bring your way. And you also cannot, for any reason, leave room for your flesh. Paul said it himself, I die daily. Every single day, Paul had to lay his flesh down. So do we. You know what's awesome about that? When you lay your flesh down, the scripture also says His mercies for you are new every morning. And in great is His faithfulness. There's a warning for the church. It's not just victory, but this is the church I'm preaching it in, so it is for victory today. Disobedience we embrace, it's my second point, becomes pain we endure. Disobedience we embrace becomes pain we endure. And that's what we see in our main passage. In Judges chapter 2 and verse 3, remember what's happened here. By the time we get to verse 3, the angel of the Lord says, So now I say, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall become thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare to you. You see, the Israelites didn't face the reality of verse 3 until they broke their covenant with God. God said... These are the things you have to do. You take hold of the promises that I've given to you and you drive out everything that's there that's not supposed to be. They took hold of the land because that's the fun part. I got an inheritance in God. Hallelujah. But then the difficult part popped up. I got to drive out the people who are there. I got to drive out the things that are there. The enemy that's there has to go. God told them to do that because he knew their hearts. If they left the enemy in close proximity, it wouldn't be far too long before they fell into sin. We see this same trend continue a little later in the same chapter. In Judges 2, 13 through 15, it says this. That there's, there's a phrase at the very beginning of verse 13. Look at what the children of Israel did. Say it. They did what? They abandoned the Lord and served the Baals and the Asherah. God had warned them, I'm going to keep reading it in just a moment, but God had warned them, hey, if you leave the enemy floating around, if you leave them in close proximity and you don't get rid of these things I'm telling you to get rid of, if you don't remove what I'm telling you to remove, you're going to trip up and you're going to fall. More specifically, these people are going to be a thorn in your side and their gods are going to trip you up. Children of Israel didn't listen. They ignored what God had told them to do. And how many of you know what sin is? Sin in general is just disobedience to what God has said and what He's ordained for your life. It's not just doing bad things. If that was the case, that passage in James wouldn't be true that says, for a man who knows good and does it not, for him it's sin. So sin is not just I did the bad stuff. It's also being disobedient about the good that God tells us to do. And I'm telling you, this is a true principle, that if you're disobedient... If you don't do the things that God has ordained for your life, there are always consequences. I mean, if that wasn't real, hell wouldn't exist, friends. Am I right? Let's continue the passage. So, because they abandoned the Lord, it says, the anger of the Lord was kindled against them. How many of you know that's not a good place to be? And look what He did. He gave them over to plunderers who plundered them, and he sold them into the hand of their surrounding enemies so that they could no longer withstand their enemies. Is that God being ruthless? No, it's God leaving the people to their own devices. This is what you want, and this is what you get. And there are too many people in the church that gripe, God, I'm, I'm suffering. He says, well, you walk right into it, honey. How many times did the pastor, how many times did your spouse, how many times did this friend have to tell you and warn you and encourage you and push you, but you said, no, I'm going to do what I want to do, and now you're in trouble. And No, this is, listen, 
Friends, I'm going to tell you this right now. God's judgment is every bit of His mercy and His grace, just the same as it is in the way that we all think of grace as undeserved favor. God loves you so much, and He loves me so much, that if we refuse to listen to Him, He will let us go through stuff because it will cause us to turn back to Him. You see that all throughout the Old Testament. The children of Israel, all throughout the book of Judges even in particular. They're handed over to an enemy because they want to do their own thing. They start whining enough and say, hey, we had it better with God. God hears their cry, raises up a judge. They live in victory for a period of time. What happens? They do the same thing all over again and again and again. Let me get through this passage here. Verse 15. It says, whenever they marched out, the hand of the Lord was against them for harm. Whew. We don't like that. God loves me. But when you make covenant with the enemy, do you not also become an enemy of God? And we don't want to look at it that way. Well, that's Old Testament preaching. No, we read that in James 4. That's New Testament. When you become a friend of the world, you become an enemy of God. Nobody wants to talk about the wrath of God. Nobody wants to talk about the wrath of God because it doesn't make us feel good and it doesn't put butts in seats. Come here, let me give you a little TED Talk and, and, and let you feel good. No, let's talk about the truth. And the truth is that God loves you. The truth is that God does care about you. The truth is that He loves you so much that Jesus suffered for you. But He suffered for a reason. And it wasn't just like, oh, I'm going to show you my love. No, the wrath of God was paid for through the sacrifice of His Son. God's wrath. Read the book of Revelation, friends. It's a pretty crazy story. There's a reason so many people debate on it. There's a lot of wild stuff that's going to happen at the end of this thing. And it's going to happen that way because of sin. Now praise God for His grace for those of us who come into covenant relationship with God. But friends, the wrath of God still exists. And these people, the children of Israel, as they've turned their back on God, it says that they have become so far gone that the hand of God was against them for harm. As the Lord had warned and as the Lord had sworn to them. And they were in terrible distress. How many of you know that that last sentence is true if the hand of God is against you? You're going to be in terrible distress if the hand of God is against you for harm. Right? But there's a key phrase in there. This wasn't a surprise. This wasn't God pulling a fast one on the children of Israel. This wasn't God saying, Oh, you've done one thing and made me mad, so I'm going to come down with the hammer on you. No. God had warned His people multiple times throughout their history how things would operate. You serve me, my hand of blessing is going to be all over you. But if you turn your back on me and you come into covenant with the enemy when you're not supposed to, there are consequences. In Moses' generation, if you look at Numbers 33, 54 to 56, it says, You shall inherit the land by lot according to your clans. To a large tribe you shall give a large inheritance, and a small tribe a small inheritance. Wherever the lot falls for anyone, that shall be his. According to the tribes of your fathers, you shall inherit. Now the part I want you to focus on, verse 55 and 56. But if you do not drive out, that phrase drive out means to remove the previous tenants. It's talking about an eviction. Get out. You don't live here anymore. To destroy the inhabitants of the land from before you. If you don't do that, then those of them whom you let remain shall be as barbs in your eyes and thorns in your sides. Does this not sound familiar? And they shall trouble you in the land where you dwell. Verse 56, this is key. And I will do to you as I thought to do to them. When you come into covenant agreement with the enemy, don't be surprised when you receive the consequences of the enemy. Friends, we can't play games with sin and compromise. There's too much compromise in the church. Why do you think so many churches and so many different things have been exposed? Let me tell you, there's more of that coming. Get ready. Get ready. God, listen, judgment starts in the house of God. So God will clean up His bride. He's coming for a pure and a spotless bride. How many of you know the Bible says that too? That means the things that are unclean in the house of God have to be dealt with. It means that the things in God's people as individuals have to be dealt with. And listen, this isn't a beat you over the head. There's liberation from all this stuff. 
It's real simple, and we'll get to it in a minute. But we have to understand the gravity of what we're talking about this morning. You don't have time to play around with sin. And I'm not looking anybody in the eye to say, I know you're in sin, but I want to look around because I believe as I make eye contact with a few people, Holy Spirit's going to grab a hold of your heart. It'll be like, I'm looking right through you. And I'm telling you, quit playing games. Quit playing games with sin. If I look at you and you don't feel nothing, don't feel like... <laughs> He's looking right through me. He said he was going to. No. <laughs> the Holy Spirit does the work. I'm just preaching, all right? You can't play games with sin. Oh, preacher, you're talking a works-based salvation. No, I'm talking about God's people being completely liberated and free. It's a difference. You didn't lose your salvation. I'm not saying God's turned His back on you. because you... No, what I'm saying is, is you're polluting your relationship with God with things in the world, and you're wondering why you're getting the world's consequences by participating in the world's actions. You will reap what you sow. and You can either sow seeds of godliness or you can sow seeds of sin. Whatever you put in the ground, that's what you're going to eat from. And that's what the people around you are going to eat from. we got to stop playing games, friends. So here it is. Moses tells them in verse 56, Numbers 33. He tells them, he says, Through a word of the Lord, I will do to you as I thought to do to them. I will do to you what I was going to do to your enemies. That's scary stuff, guys. Scary because the hand of God being turned against you because you've Aligned yourself as an enemy of the Lord. Oh, well, that's one passage. Well, everybody likes to quote Joshua 24. There's a passage in Joshua 24 where Joshua stands up in front of the children of Israel and says, As for me and my house, help me, we will serve the Lord. A bunch of you probably have that hanging somewhere in your house. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Praise God. It's an awesome declaration. Just a few verses later, Joshua and his generation, this is at the end of Joshua's leadership, right before we get into the book of Judges. He tells them, he says, if you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, in Joshua 24 and verse 20, if you forsake God and serve foreign gods, He's going to turn and do you harm and consume you after having done you good. Friends, I'm telling you, we're talking about some serious stuff here. What have you come into agreement with in your life? What tents have you set up in your backyard for the enemy to hang out because you want them close because it makes your flesh feel good or because you're too scared to deal with it? Now listen, I'm not saying let's all go home, start fighting with our spouses because they got devils. Or our kids need, need deliverance right this second. That, all those things might be true. And those might be things you've got to work through, all right? Hear me out. Like I'm, I'm, but I want us to focus for a moment here. And I've said this before because this can happen. When we start talking about stuff like this, our immediate response typically is, oh, yeah, I know Brother So-and-so. he got some demons. He needs set free. <laughs> He's got this little speck in his eye. He's got a little speck in his eye. And Jesus says, what about the gigantic log in yours? I'm telling you what, critical spirit. Woo, you want to talk about what will bring division to a church? When we start talking about stuff like this, and everybody wants to go, you're the one with the problem, you're the one with the You want to know why some people have so many issues in their houses? Critical spirit. I'm not talking about constructive criticism. I'm saying you beat up your spouse with your words every day, and you wonder why your relationship's not any good. Critical spirit is not from God. God did not give you the gift of criticism. I don't find that anywhere in the Bible. It's not one of the spiritual gifts. I can, it's a spiritual gift, all right, but not one of the Holy Spirit's gifts. Yeah. Friends, we're talking about some serious stuff here. But the good news is, everything that we've talked about, we could go all the way back to something I said at the very beginning of this message, toward the very beginning of this message. If we were to pull up, and you might have to go dig in here a little bit, for this to be on the screen. But if you were to go all the way back to Judges chapter 2 and what God said at the end of verse 1, Judges 2 and verse 1, that last little phrase in verse 1, He is a good God. I will never, God says, I will never break my covenant. 
I will never do it. I use the terminology covenant. It's a binding agreement. Lack of better description, it's a contract. It's the same as it is here with my wife and I. We have a binding contract legally that says we're married. As a bride of Christ, spiritually we have a binding contract with the Lord. And I tell you right now, if my bride cheated on me, I'd be pretty honked off. Jesus feels the same way. If your spouse did that to you, you'd probably be pretty upset. Scripture has a lot to say about all that kind of stuff in the natural. If there's infidelity and adultery in a relationship. Can you imagine how serious God takes it? Serious enough that if you turn your back on Him, and you align yourself and come into agreement with the things of the world, it says that you receive the same fruit that the enemy would receive. That the things that God had planned for your enemy, you join in that participation because you've come into agreement with them in your life. Now, I'm going to be very clear about something today. I'm not talking about your spouse. If anybody hears what I have to say and hears maybe I should get a divorce, that's a lie from the pit of hell. Don't you, don't you dare. Don't you dare go home and say, God told me through the word we're supposed to split up. God hates divorce. Now, praise God if there are people who've been divorced in the church. There's grace, there's freedom, and, and maybe God's redeemed you through whatever relationship you're in now. Praise the Lord for that. I understand there's biblical purposes for that. But the truth of the matter is, there's nothing I'm saying now that's going to cause you to go home and be like, God told me to split up for my spouse. No. Shut up. That is not from God at all. Having said that, there are some of you here relationships you've got to cut off. You don't like to hear that. I'm supposed to love everybody. Well, you're not loving them. They're loving you and they're bringing you into the world. They're not, you're not bringing them to Jesus. My parents taught me that a long time ago when I was growing up. I remember having conversations with both of my parents, and they would tell me, we don't care who you're friends with as long as you're influencing them or if they're a godly influence in your life. But if you've got relationship with somebody that's pulling you into sin, my parents were not ashamed to say, you ain't hanging out with that one anymore. Why? Because they love me. They're protecting me. There are some of you, those relationships, that's that tent in your backyard. Oh, it makes my flesh feel good. I enjoy that. For some of you, it has nothing to do with people. It has to do with particular sins that you're quite fond of in the flesh. You've got a pretty house that you keep clean. And you've got one little dark room that you like to try to hide from everybody. It's quiet in here for a reason. Some people are getting convicted. I didn't think I'd get a lot of amens on this. That's okay. Your amen will come when you go home and start living the way God's ordained for you to live. Friends, I'm not trying to beat you down. I'm trying to say, look, let's identify the areas in which we come in agreement with things we're not supposed to be so that we can take those things to the foot of the cross set free and live in that freedom you can be free from that addiction you can be free from those games that continue to be played in your mind but I want to say this to you and we're preparing I'm preparing to close you cannot complain about thorns in your side when you give a rose bush a hug You can't. But you know what I find? That's the only thing some people are going to remember, and I hope it sticks. You know what's funny? That wasn't even planned. That wasn't even planned. Hey. Let's just close in prayer right now. I don't know that I'm going to top that. You know what's funny? I was funnier, not even trying to be funny. But... Woo! It's the only thing anybody's going to remember. <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> Isn't it like God to bring something lighthearted to a heavy message? 
I didn't even intend for the rose thing to be funny. It's just the way it came out. But how many times in your life, how many times in your life have you complained about that thorn in your side when it was your fault? Not everything's your fault. I understand that. Not every trial, not every difficulty, not everything you're dealing with is, is, is on your shoulders. Sometimes it is your fault. Sometimes it was you who ran right up to that rose bush and said, that looks pretty, let me get a hold of that. And then you got poked. I don't know about you, but I'll say this for me. I'm hoping you would say the same thing. I don't want there to be a single morsel of anything that the enemy has in my backyard. I want every bit of it off of my property. No place for the enemy in my house. I'm going to tell you a story. I'm not going to give specifics, but the enemy has been trying to use a real heavy spirit of fear on my family for about the last month. Afraid to discuss difficult things with people. Even difficult things with, with our upcoming baby. That... The enemies just try to plant seeds of doubt and worry for no reason, just because the devil's a liar. Had us worrying about stuff that wasn't even true. And when you give the enemy that kind of access to your life, he'll wreak havoc. And we got some liberation this week, praise God, in a lot of different ways, because we got tired of putting up with the enemy's nonsense. So my question is, how many people in this place are over it today? And how many of you are ready to quit dealing with the nonsense? Leave it at the feet of Jesus.